Okay, good morning everyone and can I welcome everyone to the 19th meeting of 2018 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones or other devices to silent mode so they don't disrupt the meeting. We have one apology uh, this morning from their Deputy Convener, Paul McNeil, who can't can't be with us, and we move to agenda item one, which is the decision to take an item in private. And the committee is asked to agree that item seven, pre-budget scrutiny, is taken in private. Is the committee agreed? Thank you. Uh, agenda item two is subordinate legislation. The committee will take evidence on the early years assistant Best Start Grant Scotland regulations 2018. This is subject to the affirmative procedure. And can I welcome Shirley Ann Somerville, Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People. Uh, Ms Somerville, I think it's the first opportunity is it? we've had to have you at the committee, so can I, can I welcome you to your role and look forward to working constructively with you in, in the months and years ahead. And can I also welcome Dorothy Ogle, Best Start Grant Policy Team Lead and Colin Brown, Solicitor Scottish Government. You're both very welcome. Thank you for, for coming along. Uh, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement and then we'll move to some questions. Thanks. Thank you, Convener, and I'm happy to be here today to assist the committee in its consideration of the Early Years Assistance Best Start Grant Scotland Regulations 2018. These are the first set of regulations under the Social Security Scotland 2018 Act, which set out the rules for a new Scottish benefit and will allow Social Security Scotland to take applications and process the BSG Pregnancy and Baby Grant. Assuming these regulations alongside the tribunal regulations are passed, we will be able to begin making payments by Christmas well ahead of schedule. Given the DWP's failure to keep to schedule on its implementation plans, officials are now working through options to deal with the consequences and to ensure that our work remains on track to do this. The Best Start grants will be a form of early years assistance provided for under Section 32 and Schedule 6 of the Social Security Scotland Act. They will support lower income families with children by offering financial support at key transition points in the early years. The grants are intended to improve children's well-being and alongside other interventions in early years provide the best start in life. When fully implemented, there will be three Best Start grants available and in keeping with good practice, the Best Start grants will be implemented in stages, ensuring that we have a firm foundation before we move on to the next step. The three payments are a pregnancy and baby payment of £600 for a first child and £300 for any subsequent child. This will help with the expenses in pregnancy or having a new child. An early learning payment of £250 and this will help with the cost of early learning at around the time a child may take up a nursery place to support child development. And a school age payment of £250. This will help with the cost of preparing for primary school. As I have said, the first payments of the pregnancy and baby payment will be before Christmas 2018. The next stages of early learning and school age payments will be introduced by summer 2019. In due course, therefore, there will be two additional schedules of regulations to provide for the early learning and school age grants. The current draft instrument will be amended to include schedules for all three grants. The regulations being considered today provide detailed rules relating to the pregnancy and baby payment. They include provision for eligibility, including residence, the assistance that will be available, the value of the payments and when to apply. The regulations also include provisions for timescales for the processing of redeterminations and certain issues of process relating to application dates. Regulations have been developed with extensive consultation and user engagement. We provided illustrative regulations to the committee in September 2017, and this was followed by a formal consultation which ran from the 23rd of March to the 15th June this year. As you know, the committee took evidence on draft regulations during the consultation period. I took this and other consultation responses into account when making final decisions on the Best Start grants, and I am pleased to be able to confirm two changes to the original policy. To ensure that more kinship carers will be eligible, the tests for responsibility for a child include receipt of child tax credits, universal credit child or child benefit for the child they are applying for. Certain legal orders will also be taken as evidence. This means the test now captures formal and informal kinship carers who have either secured a DWP benefit for the child they care for or where there is a legal arrangement in place. If responsibility for a child changes during one of the application windows, for example, where a child moves from living with a parent to a kinship carer, a second payment can be made to the new carer. 
For parents under 20, concerns were raised about the grandparent qualifying, in particular around the rights of the child, empowering young parents, and the possibility that the young parent might not benefit from the money. In response to these, and in keeping with the social security principles of dignity and respect, we are offering a choice for young parents. A young parent who is under 18, or 18 or 19 and still in full-time education or training, can be the qualifying person or the grandparent can be the responsible person and qualify for the payment on the basis that they are responsible for the parent having the baby. I hope this has been useful to the committee in their consideration, and I am happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm sure it is. Before I move to, to other committee members, I was just reviewing some notes on this, and you were kind enough to write to myself as convener on 11th September in relation to... Uh, the Best Start Grant. And just the start of your letter said, as you know, as part of this year's programme for government, we announced last week that we intend to bring forward the first payments of the Best Start Grant Pregnancy and Baby Grant to 2018. And I suppose this is the key bit, and I think you referred to it in your opening statement, assuming DWP puts the required systems in place for us to do so. You also mentioned, and I welcome this greatly, that those first payments could be in people's bank accounts uh, before Christmas, a particularly financially straining time for any individual or family, never mind when there's a, a new child in the household and you're a low-income family. So that would create a great expectation and anticipation among some that um, this money could come just at the right time for them. So I would therefore have concern about that caveat, assuming DWP puts the required systems in place for us to do so. Could you maybe expand on that a little bit, because there's some concern there? Uh, certainly. There have been a number of uh, concerns um, recently when we have been developing our work with BSG uh, because the DWP has changed their timeframes for a, a particular area of work. That would... Um, um, in, in essence, allow someone at social, in the Social Security Agency to be able to easily um, um, have access to information about an applicant. Um, unfortunately, despite the fact that um, we began this joint planning with DWP in November 2017, and we had been working to an initial start date uh, around June 2018, of the agency being able to um, have access to the customer information system, uh, this is now uh, not going to be uh, the case. Uh, DWP have now informed us that there's a further delay to that work at their end. However, officials um, and uh, the agency are now working on contingency arrangements to ensure that we will be able to continue with um, our um, with the, the, the uh, statement that the First Minister made in a programme for government, and we will still work towards payments being made before uh, December 20 or uh, within December 2018. That will be done because of the contingency arrangements within the agency, not because the DWP uh, actually completed their work to ensure that the agency could have access to the customer information system. I ask, is that an additional expense to the, the, the new Social Security Agency to put in those contingency arrangements? What it will mean is that, um, in essence, the, the process that a client advisor will have to go through to check eligibility um, with an applicant will be more time-consuming um, and will require more manual inputting. That will obviously have an impact on the agency, and uh, uh, the agency is now uh, looking to work through the implications of that contingency. But the important aspect to stress is that we will ensure that we will move as, as promised uh, with our timetable of ensuring payments um, are, uh, uh, have begun before the end of the year. Okay, there will in theory be a, a, a notional cost somewhere down the line in, in relation to that, I would imagine. Can I ask you, when, when the Scottish Government or the Scottish Social Security Agency liaises with DWP in relation to these matters, they can get quite technical and always understand it myself, do, do the DWP do that uh, in a collegiate way, do they, do they charge a fee for that interaction? What, what's the relationship there? I have to say that the relationship between DWP officials and Scottish Government officials and agency officials uh, on a working level uh, is, is good. Uh, this is, after all, a, a, a joint process. We can't deliver devolved social security without the DWP in many ways. However, there comes a time when, because of the overarching priorities within a very, very large department like DWP, uh, that there are implications to the timetable 
timetables that they are working on and therefore the, the timetables that they give because of uh, what they're doing on devolved benefits will slip. Now, that's um, exceptionally unfortunate. It's something which uh, we try to mitigate by uh, speaking to the DWP as early as possible uh, within uh, um, our work so that they know what, what we wish to achieve and on what time frame. Um, so the relationship um, is, is good at an official level, but we remain frustrated that in practice, uh, sometimes the, the priority given to the devolved benefits is perhaps uh, not the one I would like to see. Uh, 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 I'd ask within that, do they charge for the privilege of getting that relevant information or do they just do liaise as a matter of course? We or? liaise as a matter of course uh, with officials. Obviously, if we make changes to a system that we require DWP to make, to make if we require DWP to make changes to their system, then there is a cost to DWP um, and there is a responsibility or, um, on ourselves to, to meet that cost. But So there's a difference between if we ask DWP to make changes to a system and just the simple liaison between officials, which, which goes on as a matter of course. Just probing that relationship, because I suspect that there, that there will be other benefits and scenarios where that relationship will, will, will have to continue and endure and be be delivered timidly to make sure the, Sc the Scottish Social Security Agency can, can deliver Scottish Government priorities on target. I mean, I'm disappointed if the suggestion is that the DWP doesn't see uh, paying low-income mums uh, much-needed money before Christmas as a priority for them, if, if you're suggesting that is not one of their top priorities, that, that would certainly disappoint me. Can you tell me, have you experienced these kinds of delays previously? There are uh, an ongoing exchange and dialogue between agency, um, between my officials and between the DWP around the timing of all the work that we're doing for, for every benefit. Um, now, of course, there are sometimes changes, there are slippages to timetables, and that is why, as I said previously, we try to do this as early in a process um, as possible. I think my concern about this one is that the the there has been a continuous number of slippages in this very important work to access the customer information service. And then we receive um, the, the latest details about the latest slippage uh, very late on in the day and very close to when they already knew that we would be going live with a project. And that obviously has implications. Now, because of the work that the agency um, is doing, there are contingencies uh, that they are working on that we can still deliver on time. Uh, that becomes more challenging, obviously, the more, the more complex the benefits are. We can do this with Best Start Grant for, for these uh, initial payments, but obviously it's a challenge to the agency ongoing to ensure that we have contingencies in place if the DWP continue to, uh, to, 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 uh, to change the timetables that they have. That's helpful, because this committee, of course, would be scrutinising the Scottish Government if targets set get missed and payments aren't made, and you'd be here having to explain why that was the situation. So it's important that we get the wider picture in relation to this process. But, but wrapped up in all this, it is a good news story, of course, that, that the, these payments are still on track and they will be made to some of the most vulnerable families in our constituents. So I, I appreciate that information. We'll move to some other questions now. Alison Allen. Uh, just uh, on, on the back of those, those questions from the convener there, I wonder if you could mention whether or explain whether the DWP have offered any detailed explanation as, as to the reasons for their delay. You, you've indicated that you don't feel they, they approach the issue as a priority, but have they offered any detailed explanation as to, as to their stance? I think not particularly for, for this delay over the customer information um, service. I think the, the challenge is uh, that, as committee is well aware, the devolution of Social Security is but one aspect of what the DWP are doing. And we are trying to link into an exceptionally complex DWP system um, that uh, has its own challenges, uh, to uh, be polite about it, around um, other um, aspects of what DWP do. And therefore, we are not trying to link into a static system. So this is a, a system that is constantly changing. And therefore, they have um, other priorities uh, in terms of their work on, on IT systems. And I think the challenge is when those 
competing priorities that may happen at a wider corporate DWP level then impact on, on what we are doing. So I, I don't think there's a specific reason that we've been given. I can certainly check, but I, I don't um, believe there's a specific reason why we've been given that this particular project has been delayed. Um, but uh, as I say, this is, is but one project in a number that DWP will obviously carry out. So, so from your point of view, uh, in ensuring that the, the payments are made by Christmas, can you say a bit more about what that actually practically means? How, how, do, you, how do you manage that situation? How, how do you ensure that those payments are made? What, what, what do you have to do to make up for that deficit, that, 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 uh, that deficit of activity from the DWP? Well, as I said to the convener, what the, the agency will have to do will be more time consuming and more labour intensive. So rather than being to be able to access information on the screen direct from DWP system, uh, they will have to check um, in a different way and then manually input um, information into a system. That's obviously more time consuming and the more manual inputting into it, then we have to um, um, ensure there are no errors in, in the manual inputting. So it's obviously much easier if we can access the information, see the information and use it directly. But uh, I, I would stress that the, the agency um, has uh, been concerned that there might be a delay for some time and that there has been slippages. And that's why there's been a lot of work behind the scenes to ensure that um, they are looking at the contingencies to ensure that the staff are ready, are trained and enabled to, to, to take that up. So I would give the committee the assurance that the agency has been working for some time on these contingencies uh, to ensure that they work and that the staff are comfortable uh, to, to actually deliver those in due course. I, I take it from what you said that at a political level you, you've registered your concerns about the, the situation. Uh, have you had anything uh, approaching a, a detailed response to those concerns or a political response to those concerns? I, I did raise uh, my concerns uh, directly with Esther McVeigh and David Mundell when we had the Joint Ministerial Working Group. I think that was in September. Um, I was down in London for that and I stressed that we were concerned that this would have an impact on our ability to deliver the project in a most efficient manner. I think the fact that um, the agency has uh, got contingency measures in place um, means that obviously our, our timetable wasn't under threat. And um, while uh, they noted my concern on that, they also noticed that, noted that the agency had contingencies in place and we would be able to deliver the benefit. And that's a, a concern, perhaps, that the, uh, there was a reliance on the agency to work out how to deal with this um, rather than to, uh, to try and deal with the initial problem, which was the DWP um, concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Shula Robinson. Yeah, I, I think it is concerning that the relative priority being given to devolved benefits uh, appears to be quite far down the list. And I think what would be helpful on an ongoing basis is for perhaps a regular update of any delays that might impact on the further devolved benefits that um, that are being uh, rolled out on, in due course. So if, if the Cabinet Secretary was able to keep us regularly furnished with uh, the impact of those delays, I think that would be helpful. The information system, um, uh, just to clarify, is it still your intention that eventually, once these issues are resolved, that is the system that you would want to use um, and these contingency measures are, are short term or are they developing an alternative system that would be... Um, <coughs> potentially used in the longer term? It, no, this is very much a contingency for the short term. Uh, we don't know at present uh, how short term uh, that will be because we are um, waiting to see when the, um, the access to uh, the SIS system uh, will, will actually take place. Uh, so I don't have a definitive answer as to how long this will be for, but it's certainly very much our intention to, to progress to that in, in the long term. As, as I said earlier, it's, it's far more effective um, and it's uh, f uh, far better for uh, the client advisors to be able to access that information and therefore obviously for, for those that are phoning the helpline so they could get that information as timidly as possible. So once um, these issues are resolved and there's access to the information system, would that access then roll forward for the other benefits or would the, it need to be a whole set of other changes to the information system? Well, I think one of the challenges is we're continuously having to look at 
uh, what new information that we require for every benefit. Now, once um, we have access uh, to the system, then we have access, the agency has access to, to the system, and that will help on, on an ongoing basis um, with the calls. That doesn't mean to say that there won't be other challenges um, when we're moving towards um, other payments that we will require assistance from the DWP to be able to link into other parts of their system. Well, it'd be helpful for us for you to let us know once that, that access is, is gained and these issues are resolved. Just looking forward to the kind of future relationship and where the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission, I think, had um, made a, um, I think they wrote to the committee saying that they, they wanted to have a, a formal agreement with the DWP as they do with HMRC. Um, and I think um, there was a, a support for that, which I guess, I don't know whether that would have helped resolve any of these issues, possibly not, but do you think, is that something that you feel is still important? Um, what do the DWP think of that? Have they responded and would it help to perhaps um, avoid these things happening in the future or do you think it would make any difference at all? It wouldn't have helped with this issue because this um, particular issue is a delay to a DWPIT system change, which um, is, is, is solely to do with, with DWP and their IT systems. Um, I, I do have um, a great deal of sympathy with what uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission have said when they were uh, relating the, the need for them to have access to um, information. I do note that they, they have had that and have seemed to have a good working relationship with HMRC, for example. So I, I have written um, to the Secretary of State on this issue uh, giving my support to the Fiscal Commission. Um, I've yet to receive a reply to that letter um, that was, I think it was only done at the, um, I think the 19th of September. Um, so I, I've yet to receive a reply, but I think it is very important that a memorandum of understanding is um, is is um, in place with the DWP to allow the Fiscal Commission to be able to access this, the information that they need that will also um, have uh, implications to what they, um, which they advise to, to, to government and state to government. The flow of information and the technical no. detail. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. OK, thank you. Mark Griffin. Thanks, Kimura. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I've got a few questions that cover a couple of different areas, um, if that's so okay, Kimura. First one is just continuing the discussion that we've been having, and you'd spoken about the, the burden on the Social Security Agency in terms of increased work as a result of the failure of the DWP to give access to that information system. Is that going to cause any difficulty for applicants? Um, the way I'm seeing it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you had access to that DWP system, you would be able to check an applicant's entitlement automatically. Is that going to require an applicant to give proof of an entitlement um, during that process and cause them an extra burden? No, I, I, I can assure the committee um, that there will be no difference to what an applicant um, sees or, or um, has an experience of during this process. This is purely what happens behind the scenes uh, when we are looking at an application. So the applicant will have the same assistance, uh, the same support, same reassurance that they'd get um, from the agency whether this had happened or not. And the, the very much the basis of the contingency we've got in place was very much um, from, from, um, from that point of view that what we will put in place um, will mean that the applicant will have the same experience that they would have. So though you'll be able to check their eligibility without them having to provide any extra information? There'll be great. no difference. Okay. That's great. And the next question I have was just a, more of a technical question. Um, on the order specifically around the multiple pregnancy supplement. And I was just looking for a bit of uh, reassurance that um, the, the line and the order is that supplement is to be added to the grant in respect of only one of the children born or to be born. Um, I just was looking for a, an assurance that the, the multiple pregnancy supplement um, would cover um, not just a twin birth, but a triplet birth or anything beyond that, and that there would be a £300 supplement for every additional child who was born? Yes, that's my understanding as well. OK, that's great. Thanks very much for that as well. Um, and um, my other questions were around the timing of the introductions of the payment. Are you able to set out 
why the um, pregnancy and baby payment is going to be made at the point that you set out, but the um, early learning payment and the school age payment are being deferred until summer next year? Certainly. This is as part of, um, as the committee is aware, our um, first priority around social security is the safe and secure transition and the staged implementation to what we do. Uh, it's what we did for carers allowance supplement when we batched payments. And for this, the decision has been taken that we will uh, move forward with one payment and then we'll move forward with the second and, and third payments. The reasons for that is that although we are now paying the carers allowance supplement and so the agency is very much up and running and experiencing calls and assisting, this is entirely uh, different because it's um, the first application-based process. It's um, a different payment system. So uh, as with all of the aspects that we'll do, and we'll do this in a staged and, and managed process to ensure that the applicants get the best possible experience as we go through this. So while there is always the wish to do things faster and to, to try and ensure that the payments are in as quickly as possible. I won't do that um, um, at the, the, the jeopardy of our very determined uh, policy of doing things in a staged implementation manner so that we can learn lessons along the way, particularly when we're doing things as new for the first time. Thank you. Final convention. A uh, question, Commissioner, was around um, uptake. Just to ask what the government is going to be doing around boosting uptake of the payment, and particularly after the discussion, the debate we had um, in the chamber on Tuesday around those hard-to-reach groups and uh, black, black and minority ethnic communities in particular. Well, it's, there's a number of, of um, methods that we're going to have to take, and they'll be different for the, the different payments that the agency will be looking at. When we're looking at Best Start Grant in, in particular, we're very mindful of what's already happened um, and the, the processes that are already in place to ensure that expectant mothers, for example, um, are encouraged um, to take up um, their um, entitlements. Um, so that's why there's been a great deal of work, for example, with um, the health services, particularly midwifery and health visiting family and earth partnerships, uh, to ensure that the health visiting um, pathway has information around a uh, Best Start grant, um, and also to ensure that there's a link with the financial health check uh, that um, is part of this process as well. In terms of the, the difficult to, to reach groups, um, which um, you mentioned, I, I think that's one of the reasons why when we're going forward with uh, the Best Start grant, we're also linking with a lot of different agencies and stakeholders to make sure that they are fully um, up to date with what's going on so that they can pass that information out. We're also looking at um, a communication strategy that will ensure that we're getting the information out to stakeholders and direct uh, to, to individuals themselves. So there's not one stream of work that will go on. There's um, road shows that will, will take place, for example, just as we did for Carers Allowance Supplement. Um, there will be the communication strategy that will, will take place as well um, with a specific specific eye on how we deal with um, individuals who may not even know that they're eligible, may not even know that there's a payment out there um, that they're for and encourage people to, to come forward. So we're very much looking at that. And obviously there will be lessons to learn. I'm more than happy to work with the committee as we go forward about the lessons that we will learn um, on the uptake as we inevitably go on with this. Thank you, Commissioner. Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener. Good morning and welcome. Um, I think I'll carry on from where my colleague Mark Griffin left off there. Um, we are told, well, the Scottish Fiscal Commission um, projects 58% take up off the Best Start grant um, by 2022. And I appreciate that means tested benefits tend to have a lower take up rate and that this figure would be an increase on the take up for the Sure Start grant, but it still means that 42% of families um, are still missing out. And um, I appreciate the steps that you've outlined to Mark Griffin, but will the government, you know, have a really good look at that figure? Um, and if you feel that even that 58% isn't being met, you know, will you, are, are there actions that are being considered if 
it becomes apparent that take-up isn't all it needs to be. Well, I, as I stated to Mark Griffin, I think this will be a learning process and it's not one that we're ever going to say that we'll get right at day one. We're determined to do everything that we can, uh, but there will inevitably be lessons that we will learn around take-up. Obviously, the Fiscal Commission's um, numbers that they gave on take-up were lower than um, what the Scottish Government uh, forecasts had been. We had been um, forecasting a, a higher take-up for that, and I think that's very much based on the work that we know uh, that will be done to encourage people to come forward uh, to get these uh, payments. Um, but it is very difficult to, to forecast take up on a new benefit under a, a new system. And, and that's why there is a, um, a, a difference between the Scottish Government Commission um, and the Fiscal Commission uh, forecasting for that. But when it comes to the issue of, of uptake, um, anybody who is eligible for a payment that doesn't take it up is one too many. So we have to understand the reasons behind that and what we can do for that. As I say, it will be an iterative process and, and we're more than, than open to learning as, as we go on because, no, I, I, I wouldn't be satisfied with, with those figures if, if, that's what we, if that's what we have. And we've continuously got to ensure uh, that we're doing all we can, particularly for the difficult to reach people um, who will not be coming forward um, in the first instance for these payments. Yeah. I mean, obviously it is a new payment and it's being delivered by a new agency um, and I suppose Social Security Scotland is yet to develop you know, a real presence and people have got to become aware that, that that's where they need to go um, and uh, you know, it's not impossible that some people may think this is something they have to apply to the DWP for so I'd just like to understand um, you know, the Scottish Fiscal Commission raised that when it was last month and it's worked projecting the cost. So is there something in place to ensure that if someone approaches or contacts the DWP to apply for Best Start grant, um, that they're signposted to the right place? Because the worst thing that could happen is that they go to the DWP and there's not the understanding there or the information uh, you know, and that person misses out for those reasons. Uh, absolutely. And I think one of the things we have to recognise is because we now have a system where we have the DWP paying still the vast majority of benefits in Scotland and uh, Social Security um, Scotland uh, um, only delivering 15% at the very end, uh, that there will be um, individuals who aren't quite sure where payments are paid. There is a great deal of work that goes on there for, um, with the communication that DWP would give out um, and that the agency also gives out about a reserve benefit that's DWP. So I give the example of what happened for the carers allowance supplement before that went live. There was very detailed discussions about what would happen if you phoned up the DWP about the carers allowance supplement and what they would say and vice versa. Uh, so that work will happen with the best start grant and so on as well. So the, the absolute determination is in effect no one falls through the gap because it's not their responsibility to know what number to phone. It's our responsibility to get the information out to them. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Okay. Yes, Michelle Valentine. <clears throat> can I can I change this on to something else slightly? And, and looking at Schedule 2, Part 1, 4 um, of the Pregnancy and Baby B Grant under resident requirement, um, it's, it's just really a, a clarification in, in terms of understanding what it actually says. Um, and it talks about the resident requirements um, referred to in Paragraph 1C and is satisfied on any... any <clears throat> on a day, if on that day, and then obviously ordinarily resident in Scotland. Then it goes on in part two to list all the other um, elements that may be eligible, um, starting with A, habitually resident in the econo European Economic Area or Switzerland. So I, I just wanted to, to clarify what, what that means in terms of entitlement. You know, does it mean if you're in Scotland at the time of birth, or does it mean you have to be here for a period of time, or, or what does it actually mean? I'll perhaps bring in one of my officials to go through yeah. the, the detail of, of some of the residency area, but I can explain the, the, the background um, to this is, uh, again, to, to go back to um, an issue I raised with Alison Johnson about no one falls through the gaps. And one of the concerns when we looked at residency as it was initially um, laid in some of the draft regulations was that there was the potential for someone to not be eligible for a sure start grant 
down in England and not be eligible up here because um, of, of residency requirements around having to be resident in, in Scotland. So the reason that the changes have been made is to ensure that um, no one falls through a gap and that if they're here and that they're eligible, then this is an easy process for them to go through. But I, I don't know if colleagues yeah. would want to add to that a little bit. Uh, the reason it's found to habitual residence in the European Economic Area or Switzerland is essentially the coordination arrangements that currently apply throughout the European Economic Area and Switzerland, whereby people who move as nationals of those countries to another country will have the same rights of access to social security in that other country while they are resident there. So. For, for, for most people, this condition actually works through the conditions of the passporting benefits. In most cases, people have to be in receipt of a passporting benefit. The, the specific provision here is referring to the extension for people who essentially are up to about 18, who are not in receipt of passporting benefits, but will qualify by virtue of age, and it's to ensure that this is compatible with the current arrangements. Right, so... so Fundamental. I mean, the, the passport and benefit is quite clear. That, you know, if you if you're on a benefit, then you're entitled to this. But if somebody is is here passing through for want of a better or on holiday or whatever, um, I mean, when I first read that, it, it kind of almost sounded like if you happened to be in Scotland at the time you gave birth, you'd be entitled. Is is that it's, not correct? It's, then it's more than that. The, the person would have to establish that for the time being, their ordinary residence was in Scotland. Right. So Scotland would have to be the centre of their living arrangements at that time. Um, an example might be someone who comes here to study and who's going to be in Scotland for a period of time. They may still have some form of habitual residence in a different country that they intend to go back to, but at the time they are residing here, and that is more than simply being here on a day, um, then they would qualify on the same basis as somebody who was habitually resident in Scotland. Thank you. Okay. Yes, General Balfour. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, just on, on, a, on a positive note, can I just say uh, uh, to you and your officers, thank you uh, for the changes that you have made, um, which I think came out in our session with you previously. I mean, I think they strengthen it and also give greater protection, particularly for children who are very vulnerable and may be moving between different grandparents or parents. So. Um, just to be positive, have a moment to say thank you, and I think that is really helpful and strengthen the regulations. Okay, um, Cabinet Secretary, I don't know if you, you wish to respond to that or, or oh, otherwise. Always happy to receive thanks from Jeremy Balfour at any point. Excellent. The, glad to see there's a love in here uh, this, this morning. Um, can, can I just ask a little bit more about a little, just a little bit more about uptake? Um, because the committee did visit the Scottish Social Security Agency in, on, on, on Monday, um, and they had to do a couple of quite specific things for uh, uptake of the carer supplement. Um, one was when they were writing out to people, they, they actually had to write out, in, or they decided to write out in, using white envelopes rather than brown envelopes, because a lot of people who would really benefit from that saw a negative in a brown envelope. It would be a bill or something negative from an official organisation pursuing them for money rather than trying to support them. And another thing they had to do was reassure a lot of people on the telephone that this was not a scam. Generally, that this was not a scam. Um, it was too good to be true. Um, what's the catch? Uh, this can't possibly be right. And we, we, we heard that and when we were there. So I, was, I don't underestimate the challenges when Best Start rolls out in terms of the uptake that that's required. But what a lot of us, I think it came up in the debate quite strongly as well, was what we couldn't get our head around was the relatively low uptake of the, the previous Sure Start grant on the basis that we pretty much know when people are, are expecting a, a baby, you know, there's engagement with the uh, midwives, with maternity fit services, with the NHS, there is antenatal classes. There's a whole suite of statutory organisations kick in and the DWP pretty much knows those individuals who would have qualifying passported benefits to dictate access or entitlement to that. 
So, sitting here as a politician, not as someone who has to deliver it on the ground, I have to say, for the life of me, I can't see why these dots are not joined together better, because if we know who's having a child, we know the, the benefits that would make them qualify for it, and we know where they stay. Why on earth are they not going to rattle at their door to say, excuse me, you're qualifying for this, why haven't you applied for this? Some kind of soft, automatic enrolment. Now, that all sounds quite naive, and it's much more difficult, I'm sure, in terms of one agency talking to another agency, and whose responsibility is on the ground. But given what I was saying about the, the carer supplement and having to use white envelopes and persuading people this is not a scam, there is a challenge to reach hard to reach groups, but we know pretty much, there's some we don't know pretty much where they are, and we know who qualifies. So what assurances can you give there's a much more coordinated approach, or there will be a much more coordinated approach on the ground to uptake than there was under the previous scheme? Well, I think one of the, the, the main differences is that the DWP doesn't go out and promote and encourage uptake of, of the benefit um, and the payments. And I think, obviously, the clear difference to what we'll be doing is ensuring that the work, for example, as I say, that we're, that we're doing with um, health visitors, um, with uh, the NHS, ensures that we are going out and, and, and ensuring that we are promoting the uptake of this. Uh, it also does link into to, um, ongoing work separate to, in, in, in some ways, to... to, to uh, to what I'm doing in, in my remit, for example, around the, the financial health check guarantee, um, which for will ensure uh, that low-income um, families will be receiving uh, personalised advice around income maximisation, um, and also um, the other programme on healthier, wealthier children, which supports pregnant women and their families um, at risk or experiencing poverty uh, to create referral pathways between the NHS and uh, money and welfare advice services. So between the work that the agency is doing to go out there and, and promote this and uh, work that's ongoing within government to ensure that, that we are doing all we can to provide those financial health checks to low-income families, uh, that will ensure that we have a better uptake than DWP. Uh, whether it's better enough um, is something that time will tell. As I said, if, if there's one person out there that's not receiving the benefit that, that could be, uh, then that's obviously a concern that we need to challenge ourselves about what more we can do. I think it would be quite good to get more information of the the organisations on the ground, whether it's um, midwife at the 24-week uh, pregnancy check or whether it's antenatal classes or, or whatever. It'd be quite good just to, not for today, obviously, but just, just to kind of get a, 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 a kind of overview of, of, of that kind of provision on the ground to mop up access. And just finally, in relation to, and I do say it again, because it was a real strong theme that came through from our visit, People do think things are too good to be true sometimes. So what public awareness nationally, as well as locally, do you think the Scottish Government could consider just to notify and inform uh, not just expectant mothers, but there's a whole range of benefits going to be rolled out by the Scottish Social Security Agency just to let people know that these entitlements are being rolled out, uh, that it is not a scam, that it's not too good to be true, and this is your entitlement, it's not a handout to drive up, because that would drive up, I think, across the board, the uptake of not just this, but, but other other entitlements. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right to point out to the fact that there's um, obviously a challenge in the fact that the agency is new. Uh, so you're receiving a letter from an agency that you've perhaps never heard of, um, offering you money, saying it's going into your bank account. And uh, I was uh, in our uh, Glasgow offices uh, yesterday speaking to some of the staff who'd been working on the very initial uh, conversations about uh, the carers allowance supplement and the idea about is this real, is it a scam, is this letter legit was something which comes through. So there is an obligation on us to raise the awareness that the agency is in place and therefore raise the awareness of, of the different benefits. As I say, I go back to give an example um, of what we did for the Cares Allowance Supplement was it was around the road shows, there was um, adverts in local papers, there was, um, in effect, adverts taken out in local radio stations and, and so on as well 
to improve that knowledge and a lot of work done with trusted organisations because many people at this point will, will go to a trusted organisation to check out what's going on and will believe that over a new agency that they haven't heard of before. Now, this is something, obviously, which will uh, develop over time, but the work that we did with CAS is the type of work that we're looking at or the agency is looking to do for Best Start Grant, for example, and that's why I said earlier on there will be a, a full communication strategy uh, that uh, links to the, the Best Start Grant when it's being paid to ensure that we're getting that, um, we're getting that publicity for what's going on. Thank you. Uh, final question, Mark Griffin. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, I just wanted to ask the Cabinet Secretary about um, potential recovery of the um, Best Start Grant. Most of um, the people who will get the entitlement will be through a qualifying um, benefit. If there is any error on the part of the claimant or perhaps the DWP in giving someone or notifying them about the entitlement to the qualifying benefit, which is then reversed, will the Scottish Government seek to recover payment of the Best Start Grant? Well, it depends on the circumstances of the individual um, case, um, but the agency would need to, in effect, understand why DWP has decided that a person was that they, they thought was um, eligible is, is no longer eligible and why that reserved benefit wasn't properly awarded. So we will look at, the agency will look at uh, on this on a case-by-case -case basis, but then that goes back to how we're looking at any case like this and it's done with dignity and respect it's uh, done on the basis of trust and the fact that it's not up to in effect the claimant to prove that they were doing nothing wrong because we believe that somebody is innocent in this and unless there has been something specific that they have uh, carried out uh, to to commit a fraud, for example. So we're not doing this ever on the basis of trying to catch anyone out or not being sympathetic to the, the position that an individual's in. So I can't give a yes or no categorical answer because it will depend on, on a particular case. But when the agency's looking at, at any aspect to do with this, it will very much look at what happened in that individual case with a degree of sympathy and of understanding about um, that, that individual uh, case. And that's re the reassurance that I would give on the work that they are doing um, on all um, um, areas uh, around this. It will not be done in a way that assumes that a person has done something wrong and that therefore we need to claw back money. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. There have been no other questions. Um, we will now uh, move from Agenda Item 2 to Agenda Item 3 and can invite Ms Somerville to, to move the following motion um, that we have just debated. That is S5M14101. Formally moved, convener. Thank you. Um, the question is, therefore, that the Social Security Committee recommends that the Early Years Assistance Best Start Grant Scotland Regulation 20 and Draft be approved. Is the committee content to recommend approval of that instrument? OK, thank you. And we'll suspend briefly before we move to Agenda Item 4. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. We now move to agenda item four, which is still subordinate legislation. And the committee will take evidence in the following regulations subject to affirmative procedure. They are the first tier tribunal for Scotland allocation of functions to the Social Security Chamber regulations 2018, and the first tier tribunal for Scotland Chamber's amendment regulations 2018. And we will also uh, be looking at the following regulations subject to negative procedure. Those being the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland's Social Security Chamber Procedure Regulations 2018, the Upper Tribunal for Scotland's Social Security Rules of Procedure Regulations 2018, the Social Security Appeals, Expenses and Allowances Scotland Regulations 2018, the Scottish Tribunal's Eligibility for Appointment Amendments Regulations 2018. Can I welcome back the Cabinet Secretary? Good morning, still. Um, and also your officials, who are Naeem Bate, Head of Complaints, Redeterminations and Appeals Policy, Colin Brown, Solicitor, and Susan Robb, Solicitor, uh, both Scottish Government. Um, the Delegated Powers and Legislative Reform Committee considered these instruments at, instruments at its meeting uh, earlier this week. Uh, its report was circulated to members uh, on Tuesday. The DPLR committee has drawn two of the tribunal instruments to the attention of the Parliament. One has been withdrawn. The first tier tribunal for Scotland Social Security Chambers and Upper Tribunal for Scotland Composition Regulations 2018. The DPLR committee has also drawn the first tier tribunal for Scotland Social Security Chamber Procedure Regulations 2018 to the Parliament due to a lack of clarity and errors on that particular regulation the Scottish Government has committed to laying an amending instrument to correct those errors. This instrument is subject to the negative procedure. Can I invite uh, the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement after which we we'll move to questions across the whole range of statutory instruments before us this morning? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. In line with our principles of dignity, fairness and respect, we have always been clear that people will have a right to challenge decisions made by Social Security Scotland if they believe it has not made the right one. In order to realise that, realise that right and ensure appeals are heard by an independent organisation, we are creating a new chamber in the Scottish Tribunals so that people have access to justice in line with our wider approach. The six sets of regulations that the committee are considering today are required to establish a new chamber in the first tier and make provision for upper tribunal for Scotland in time for when we start to deliver the best start grant. Members um, will be aware, as the convener has noted, that the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee drew attention to one draft instrument on Tuesday in particular. I have withdrawn that instrument and will re relay a revised version shortly. That is why it is no longer on the agenda today. I want to emphasise that our aim is to create a chamber which will be easy for people to access and one that deals with appeals quickly, whilst also hearing, ensuring that the dignity and respect of individuals at the heart of the social security system. As the committee is aware, we consulted on the draft regulations and the final regulations that have been laid as the result of balancing the views of all of those who responded, while ensuring that what is proposed does not lead to operational or other difficulties. I'm pleased that there has been broad support for the proposals and want to put on record my appreciation to all who responded to the consultation, including this committee, for its contribution earlier this year. I also wish to thank and acknowledge the support provided by the members of the Judicial Re Reference Group, whose advice and guidance has been invaluable through this process. The Scottish Government report that was published on the 13th September, alongside the regulations, provides a detailed response to the consultation findings. It explains where the draft regulations have been revised to take account of the views expressed and where there was scope for change to ensure that the dignity and respect agenda is fully given effect to, or more generally to lay the foundations of an effective chamber. You may recall that when the consultation on the draft regulations was launched, the Social Security Scotland Bill was still undergoing its parliamentary process. As such, some of the provisions in the draft regulations have, of course, been updated to reflect the changes that are now in the 2018 Act. This includes reference to the Scottish Social Security Charter, the agency's role in supporting individuals who wish to exercise their right to appeal, creation of new appeal rights for challenging process decisions, the duty to promote uptake and inclusive communication, amongst other changes. And I will be happy to take questions from members. Um, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I'm conscious there are 
Uh, two affirmative uh, instruments before us and a range of uh, negative ones. So there will be a, a range of questions uh, for you th this morning. Uh, can I go to the first question from Jeremy Balfour? Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, I have four questions, two kind of overriding ones um, and two kind of specific ones. Uh, just on a very practical level, and this may be for, to take away or just for one of your um, officials to answer, at present, the, uh, and I should probably just, just remind members that I used to be a member of the tribunal service myself. Um, at present, because they all come from DWP, you can have different appeals being heard on different days. So you could have a, a PIP one, you could have a, an employment one. Obviously now with this change, um, is there any relationship going to continue so that different cases can be heard within the same day? Or will we end up simply having Scottish cases, of Scottish agencies cases being heard in one tribunal and other cases heard on another day. I think I might have to get back to the member on that point unless officials would like to come in at that stage, but I think there would be two different systems. Um, so the, the tribunal system that we're setting up at the moment is obviously for the devolved benefits and the reserved system is, is separate uh, to that. So it would be difficult to see um, how that could be on the same day necessarily. But I'll get back to the member if there's, if there's any further update on that. Thank you. Um, the second issue um, is in regard to um, expenses paid to those who sit on tribunals. Um, at present, um, the lawyer, doctor and disabled member are paid different amounts. Um, is that going to continue or will there be one single pay for all three individuals? I'll bring in my official at that point, I think. Yeah, uh, thanks. thank you for that. Um, I mean, currently, as you know, Mr Balfour, um, different members are paid different de depending on their experiences. So legal members are paid different, um, medical members are paid different, and lay members are paid different. So um, in terms of uh, t trying to harmonise that pay, I mean, that you know, that, that's a different cost to that. So you know, obviously, you know, we'd want to make sure that, you know, people are paid appropriately for giving up their time to be on the tribunal system as, as such, and that will be set out by the... Um, in, in due course. Yeah, I mean, it does always just seem to me slightly strange that three individuals turn up to do exactly the same piece of work and get paid three very different amounts, but perhaps in due course you could come back to me on that. Um, but the third question, and um, I, I may have misunderstood this, so if I have, I, I apologise. Um, where somebody um, either makes their application for a hearing late or the... Um, they, they don't turn up and do something, and they appeal that. My understanding is that the, uh, can, the chairman of the, the tribunal hears that case and decides whether the appeal should be heard or not. F from my reading of the regulations, the, that decision is then made, and then another date is set for the claimant to then come back and have that hearing heard by a, the full tribunal. And I just wondered in regard to the claimant in particular not having to come twice, but also in regard to the cost of it, it can that occur on one occasion? So it would be two hearings, but heard on the same day. I mean, in terms of, uh, as you know, Mr Balfour, when, um, if an appellant um, doesn't turn up to the tribunal, they can either inform the tribunal beforehand and the tribunal can decide either to proceed with that case or it can, or it can basically adjourn that case to allow the appellant and any representative to come to a future hearing. So it is up to the chamber president or the, the legal member in that instance to make the decision whether they have enough information in front of them in the paperwork to make a decision or do they really, or, or if they want to hear from directly from the appellants. So um, as you know, one of the, one of the uh, changes that we have taken forward in the uh, procedural rules is for to provide for um, paper-based hearing. So, I mean, as in line with the dignity and respect agenda, if an individual doesn't need to attend to a tribunal, then, you know, that it is right that they, you know, they shouldn't be inconvenienced to come to a tribunal if the decision can be made on paper, uh, on, on, on the papers which are there. But as I said, it is up to the, the legal member to decide whether they want to postpone that or whether they want to um, go ahead and make a decision. If they make a decision, the individual then does have a right to ask for that information, to, uh, for that decision to be set aside, to ask for a review of that decision. This is in regard to the set aside. If an, if an individual makes a, a, a call to have that set aside and that comes to a tribunal and the, the tribunal judge 
says, I will step outside, will the hearing then be heard on the same day, or does the claimant have to come back a second time once the set aside has been decided? In terms of um, the set aside, um, it depends on, you know, there, there's, there's a process for scheduling of the hearings as well. Um, so that's down to Scottish Courts and Tribunal Services to schedule hearings to make sure that the appropriate members are available. And as you know yourself, being a, being a former tribunal member, that, you know, tribunals have a number of hearings to consider in a daytime. So I think that's, that's an operational matter for Scottish Courts and Tribunal Services to see how, how and when quickly they can reschedule a hearing. Okay. Um, I'm, okay. I, I'm, I'm a final question, and, and I appreciate you have withdrawn these, reg the, these regulations, but just um, maybe a quick question around this. In regard to the makeup of a tribunal, there does seem to be some scope to have either two member tribunals or three member tribunals. Is it the thinking behind this that the tribunals will have only two members rather than three, or will the continued practice of having three members continue? My understanding is that's for the Chamber President and just had that confirmed as well. That's obviously part of the, um, the, the aspect which we have withdrawn from today as well due to some of the, the, the suggestions by the, the, uh, the, the other committee. Um, so we're happy to take that back and receive further questions if you've got any uh, points you might want to raise about that in due course. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Michelle Ballantyne. Yes, thank you. Um, just following up on the how tribunals are delivered. One of the, the things that I've had conversations with my local CAB office is around where tribunals are cancelled. We're in a rural area and quite often they don't happen. Um, quite a bit of concern around that. Um, and I wondered what, what your feeling is, what your plans are around location of tribunals and how you ensure, particularly in rural areas, um, that vulnerable people who are appealing, who are probably already in trouble anyway, are able to access them, because that does seem to be a bit of an issue. I think that it's a particular importance when we're looking at all aspects of what we're doing within social security is to ensure that we take account of where um, people um, are, are living and the challenges um, within that. Um, it's it's uh, obviously a, a challenge in particular rural areas. Now, it's an operational matter, not for, for um, myself and politicians to be in, involved in why things are cancelled and, and why not. But I, I do take, um, I do take uh, your point very seriously around the impact that that will have on people um, and the, the, the stress and, and difficulty that, that that will give. I think that's something we're certainly mindful of and I think that's something that, that, that um, does need to, we always need to bear in mind when we're looking at all these aspects about how they are actually delivered in rural areas as, as well. Okay. So, so in terms of um, the policy and the creation of the tribunal, I couldn't couldn't find anything that really gives any indication of of what the expectations around it. Do you expect that to be encapsulated in the charter, or uh, I mean, how how can we have some reassurance in terms of of the creation of the tribunals that that there is an expectation that they will go out to different places and that that there will be the capacity there that they won't end up centralised in urban areas and people expect it to travel to them. Sure. I, you know, I couldn't find anything in here that, that really gave me any reassurance around that. Okay, it, it's probably not something that's for the, the Charter necessarily, um, but then uh, the government isn't writing the Charter, so we'll, we'll see what comes from the, the process that is, that is being um, developed um, for that. Um, I, I think it's, um, it's something that, although it's not in the Charter, it's something that does need to be um, carefully considered. And, and I suppose the, the reassurance I, I would, um, would give is that um, there can be travel to, to different uh, locations for, for tribunals. It's not something that, in essence, um, has to be um, centralised or, or indeed should be centralised. Um, and the, the venue that is chosen should be um, close to the appellant. Now, obviously, then um, there are operational matters that, that are not for, for myself to get into, but um, the reassurance would, would very much um, be given 
that these things are taken into account and that a venue is chosen and um, that is close. And again, I stress there is no reason for these things to be centralised, no wish for these things to be centralised because this process has to be open and available to everyone, regardless of where they're working um, and living in Scotland. And I do very much take the, the point on board about the challenges of living in rural, remote or island communities um, that, that are important in this area. Okay, thank you. Okay, Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener. Um, Spice suggests that there are around 12,000 Scottish appeals to tribunal every year from PIP claimants. Um, and uh, I think that figure might likely have been even higher if, um, you know, without the system of mandatory reconsideration. Um, now, I appreciate the Scottish Government says it wants to get the decision right every time, uh, first time, and that's a laudable aim. But I'd just like to understand, you know, about 60% of PIP appeals have been successful at tribunal, um, which indicates that there's something fairly wrong with the decision making in the first place. So I'd just like to understand what the, Scot what, what the Scottish Government intends to do to bring down that figure markedly. Well, I think that in, in essence, what that um, level of appeal success uh, shows is that the current system is broken um, because we, we simply should not be getting into a case uh, where uh, the appeals um, success rate is, is anywhere near that, that high. That, that demonstrates uh, that there is a fault somewhere um, in, in the system. And, and I think that does go very much down to the points that we discussed uh, uh, during my statement and also what my uh, predecessor has, has already set out to committee about how we want to move forward about getting the right information in the right way at the earliest opportunity. So this is very much about making sure that the initial decision has been um, completed with the right information and done in a way where there's not two sides trying to catch each other out, uh, but that it's done in a supportive manner where uh, the agency is encouraging uh, the, the individual who is applying uh, to, to do so, to get all the information required uh, for the, the decision to be right. Now, of course, there will be uh, times where uh, that individual does not think that that initial uh, determination has been correct and that they are of course um, under this system uh, our new system um, entitled to a redetermination under uh, a completely different team to that made the initial decision and I met that uh, some of the members of that team uh, yesterday in Glasgow to discuss the workings of that team so that's a further step which is different to the current system that will again is intended to bring down the, the, the numbers that are, will go to appeal. The appeals process still has to be there. There will be people who, as I said in my opening statement, um, still um, wish to, to, to challenge uh, those determinations. Uh, but I am confident that we will see a, a marked decrease because we're, we are not importing the current system um, and then putting it through our new tribunal's process. We have a new system that will go through this tribunal's process that's very much based um, on a different premise to, to what is going on currently. Okay, and can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, are you content that there is the capacity for, you know, where, where appeals are simply unavoidable? And having met that team yesterday, you're content that the capacity exists to, to deal with them timiously? Well, very much, both within the agency in, deter um, in respects to the redetermination process, um, but also um, if uh, it requires to, to go to um, an, an appeal, it requires to go to a tribunal, then the capacity is, is there to, to do so. Thank you, Convener. Okay, can I ask a, just a couple of questions? Um, I was pleased to hear the statement the, the other week that there can be recordings of face-to-face -face assessments um, in, in the process. And I kind of hate to say this, but I, when I get constituency cases where, quite frankly, my constituency, what has been assessed in relation to them, bears no relation to what actually happened on the day of, of the assessment. So the, the, the audio recording could be quite a powerful tool in, in making sure the accuracy of the assessment is, is, is much more rigorous, let's put it that way, in, in, at the first time of asking. I'm just wondering what the thought was behind that, that, that audio recording and whether 
you think, Cabinet Secretary, that will help get decisions right at the first time of asking also? I think it certainly will have um, an impact. And, and like many members, including the convener, I've had constituency cases where um, the individual has said that they, they just weren't asked those questions and they certainly didn't give those answers uh, during um, a, a, a process. Um, and to, to be able to have any faith in the system, people need to... to uh, to have a, a much better faith in what happens when they're in a face-to-face -face assessment. Now, obviously, as I said to Alison Johnson, we would hope that the, the number of face-to-face -face assessments will um, um, dramatically decrease from what is on at the moment. But if it is required, then people need to have faith in what happens in that room. And also just a recognition of the fact that they will want to have that information to hand and to be able to go through that afterwards for their own reassurance. That's why it is very important for people to be able to have that, um, that audio recording and for that to be made available to, um, uh, to a, a, an appeal if that's required uh, at a later date. That hopefully gives a great deal of... Um, um, assurance to the person going through that process that, again, it isn't there to catch them out, that this is a, a, a system that's there to support them and there's full transparency around what goes on in that in the decision-making process. I should, that's helpful. I should point out that um, the, the, the claimant would have to give permission for that recording to be conducted and I assume no judgment would be made either way if the claimant didn't want that uh, audio recording to be made, but I'm just wondering in terms of data sharing, there is a, a UK appeal system that will run side by side the, 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 the new Scottish one, because I think ESA support group, for example, will still be under U UK rules. In terms of data protection and data sharing, I'm assuming if um, the claimant did not wish any of that to be passed, it just wouldn't be passed to uh, the, 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 the individuals uh, doing the, the appeals in relation to ESA, would, would, what would happen to that data? Would, there be, would, it, would, it, would it stay uh, safely um, with um, the, the Scottish tribunal system? Well, on, on um, your first point, um, I, I can reassure you that um, the audio recording is, is there for the benefit of the, the, the claimant. If they don't wish that to, to, to happen, however, um, we will have to ensure that, that, the, that those wishes um, can be respected. And of course, there wouldn't be a, a judgment about why somebody uh, would or would not wish to participate in that. Um, it is there to protect them, and it has been um, warmly welcomed um, by um, stakeholders um, and, and by the individuals I've spoken to. But if they don't want to take part in that, then, then um, we need to ensure that our system is flexible enough um, for that. Um, in relation to the other aspect around data sharing, obviously these are two separate systems that are running, um, both the agency being separate from DWP and the tribunals for devolved benefits being separate to those um, from um, the, the reserved um, benefits uh, tribunal. Um, when it comes to the aspect uh, around data sharing, I'd be um, happy to, to provide um, further clarification um, on that, um, if, if you would wish in due course. Okay, I think that would be helpful. Just a final question. I know Mark is supposed to follow up with some of this in a second, but just a, a, a final question. Uh, Jeremy Balfour raised an interesting point, of course, not one within the control of the Scottish Government in relation to having a, a PIP assessment, an ESA assessment, and, uh, and can they be on the same day or at the same time and make that as easy for claimants as possible? Of course, two, two, two different systems in relation to that. But I quite often have constituents telling me, under the current words, all the, all the DWP at the moment, they are quite often providing the same information twice one in relation to PIP, one in relation to ESA, and sometimes the information they send goes missing once, twice, three times, and then they get it in, they've got to give it again to for the ESA, and there's pretty poor coordination at the moment. That's within the one the one system from what I, I can see. Two separate systems now. Will there be any efforts made to... I don't even know where the opportunities are, to be honest with you, Cabinet Secretary, but I just see where things currently sit 
there's a lack of coordination and we're moving to two discrete systems. Is there any opportunity at all to have some form of coordination in relation to ESA assessments, one system, and PIP assessments, another system, just in terms of some of that information that's generated? Well, certainly in relation to the aspects which are devolved uh, or will be devolved uh, to the Scottish Parliament, what we're obviously trying to do during this process is to ensure that we use information that's already available um, and uh, ensure that we can access as much of that as possible so that the responsibility is, is more on, it's, it's on the agency, in effect, rather than the individual to continuously um, provide in, information and, in effect, jump through hoops at different parts of the process. Um, can I assure the committee that this will be um, a seamless process in relation to the relationship with uh, reserved benefits? Unfortunately, that's perhaps something out with my gift. I mean, we will obviously move within what we do within um, the agency to ensure, as I said, we have um, access to as much information that's already there rather than requiring um, the applicant to do something you know, twice, three times. What happens for when they are applying for a reserved benefit is, is unfortunately um, something that's, that's beyond their control. But it's an aspect, obviously, that we're keen to, to encourage the DWP to look at about what more that they can do to make a process easier for someone rather than making it more difficult. I think that's helpful because we can learn from each other. DWP can learn from the new Scottish Social Security Agency experience and potentially vice versa. But we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see, see on that. Thank, thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary Mark Griffin. Thanks, Camilla. It was just a supplementary to the convener's questions around the audio recordings. Um, I like the convener. Like the convener, I welcome that. Um, but I was just wondering if it's possible for um, deaf BSL users that a video recording could be made to support them in any potential a tribunal case, because as you can imagine, an audio recording isn't going to be of the greatest use to them. No, I, I fully take that, that, that point on board and, and obviously when we're looking at our inclusive communications, when we're looking at how these um, policy initiatives will operate in practice, we do then need to take that principle of openness and transparency and say, right, well, how does that work for different people and are there different requirements as they're going through that process? So the details of, of this will still be will still be developed um, over, over time. We're obviously some time away from having to, to deliver the assessment process ourselves, but those details about how that particularly affects an individual will be absolutely taken into account and we will never leave anyone short of information or having a lack of transparency simply because of, of uh, because they require a BSL translation or anything like that. I mean, that would completely fail in what we're, tr we're trying to do overall about the, the agency's work. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving towards the end of our questioning. So if anyone else wants a question, if they could get my attention just now, but I know Michelle Ballantyne wants in for another question. Just, just a tiny one, and it's sort of on the back of some of what's been said before, um, in terms of my concern about accessibility. Um, obviously, for the purpose of the regulations, it's very much in legal form. Um, but for somebody who, who has been turned down and is wanting to appeal, um, I'm just looking for a little bit of reassurance around the, the process in terms of the type of format um, that they, they would have to appeal. Because obviously many people are maybe not au not, um, fait with legal process anyway. Um, and if there's a lot of very formalized forms, they find that quite difficult. Um, and then there's the issue about getting somebody to support that. So I wondered if, if the Cabinet Secretary could just give me some reassurance about the methodology of appeal for someone, what they're actually faced with in terms of the, the requirement of submitting documents, the type of forms that they might have to use, and the, the conduct of the process of tribunal whilst appreciating that it has to have a, a legal format to it. How, how will you ensure that someone feels confident and able to go through that process without requiring the support of a lawyer. Mm -hmm. It's a very important point about ensuring that a person um, is never put off or faces a barrier to the next stage in a process should they require uh, to go through it. One of the aspects the committee will be very aware that we've been doing is working a great deal 
in our communication about people's rights under the new system and whether that's eligibility, whether that's um, how to, to um, interact with the new agency and when it comes to it, when, when they're in place, how to appeal. I suppose one of the important aspects um, to bear in mind is that the, the agency um, following a redetermination um, will give uh, that individual all the information they require about how an, an appeal could be taken forward. That communication, as we do with all our communications, would be tested to make sure that uh, it makes sense and, and, um, and can be easily understood by people going through the process. So we'll look at what the agency puts out, we'll look at that information. And in many ways, um, it, it's about encouraging people to take up their the rights um, so that there's there's never um, a barrier um, to that. Uh, I suppose the other aspect um, to, to bear in mind is that the agency will also forward the documents that's required so there's not a responsibility on the individual to have to uh, collect information to ensure that their case is brought forward, that the, the individual um, will receive all the information uh, about how to appeal from the agency. If they wish to do that, the agency will be able to collate uh, the information that was behind that, uh, that decision and allow that process to go forward. So uh, it's about taking um, the responsibility and taking the pressure off the individual and ensuring that the agency has more of a role and therefore always being there if people have questions about not understanding the system. So, so from that, are you anticipating that the design of the system is such that the individual shouldn't need someone to actually do it for them, that, that, that potentially they can do it themselves and not need that direct support of someone if they so wish to? Well, yes, because I think if we've got to the point where um, people would require a lawyer, for example, then that's a barrier to the system that, that we need to, to look at. So we need to be very careful in everything that we're doing around this, that although we're getting into a uh, territory that, um, yes, is um, about a, a legal process, that it's, it's explained in a way which is easily understood and which an individual um, is encouraged uh, to, to take up their rights should, should they wish to do so. Okay, are there any other questions for the Cabinet Secretary? Okay, there have been no other questions. Can we move to Agenda Item 5, which is the consideration of two affirmative instruments, and can I invite Ms Arfo to move the first motion, which is S5M14156. It moved. Thank you. The question is, therefore, that the Social Security Committee recommends that the first-tier tribunal for Scotland allocation of functions to the Social Security Chamber Regulations 2018 draft be approved. Is the committee content to recommend approval of this instrument? Yes, Thank you. Uh, can I invite Ms Somerville to move the second motion, that being S5M14157? Moved. Thank you. Uh, the question is therefore that the Social Security Committee recommends that the first tier tribunal for Scotland Chambers Amendment Regulation 20 draft be approved. Is the committee content to recommend approval of this instrument? Yes, Thank you. Um, we therefore now move to agenda item six, which is the consideration of four negative instruments. And I'll read through all four of them now. And I'll ask for the committee's permission just to note these. Um, these being the first tier tribunal for Scotland Social Security Chamber Procedure Regulations 2018, the upper tribunal for Scotland Social Security Rules of Procedure Regulations 2018, the Social Security Appeals Expenses and Allowances Scotland Regulations 2018, and the Scottish Tribunal's Eligibility for Appointment Amendment Regulations 2018. Uh, do I agree simply just to, to note these? Okay. Thank you. Well, that ends uh, agenda item six. Can, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her attendance this morning and both sets of officials we've had with us this morning. We now move to agenda item seven, which is pre-budget scrutiny, which previously agreed to take in private. Thank you.